we're just going to take a peek at Exodus 12 today. Uh, it's a big passage. It's, it's super long, but uh, we won't have time to touch on all parts of it. But it is, it, it's a very important passage. Last week, well, actually starting from the beginning, we began in Exodus with the call of Moses. Uh, Moses uh, has a really miraculous start to his life. There was a policy in Egypt at the time of his birth that uh, all baby boys born to Jewish women were supposed to be killed at birth. Um, his mother uh, uh, didn't, uh, she, she gave birth in secret, I guess, and Moses was then put into a basket. He ends up being adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, and he grows up with, a, with the first 40 years of his life sort of insulated from the troubles of the rest of his people because of this position that he's in. He then murders a guy. He saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite. He kind of flew off the handle, killed the Egyptian, buried him in the sand. Long story short, he gets found out and he runs away to Midian, to the wilderness. But, I, but in the wilderness, he, he then for the next 40 years of his life, he serves as a shepherd. He gets married, uh, he has some children, and then one day he sees this bush that's on fire, but the bush isn't being consumed. And the angel of the Lord just calls out to him and, and, and tells him that he's standing on holy ground and to take off his shoes. And, and God calls him and says, I'm sending you back and you're going to be the one that I use to, to bring my people out of bondage in Egypt. Uh, Moses, uh, when he first heard the call, he, he needed a little encouragement, just like all of us. And so God, God tells him that he's going to be with him the entire way, that he's, going, that he's equipping him, that he need not be afraid. He, Moses had, it's kind of neat, Moses had a significant speech impairment, and he tried to get off the hook because of his disability. God said, I've got you covered there. Uh, you, you're not getting off the hook just because you got something that doesn't work properly. Um, I'm going to get your brother Aaron, and Aaron can talk for you, uh, but you're going. And so Moses goes and he obeys God. And we, last week we came to the section where there's a series of judgments that come upon Pharaoh and upon the Egyptians. And, and the, the springboard for it was found, we found that in Ex, Exodus chapter, same slide, no. Um, uh, the, the springboard for it was Exodus chapter 5, when Pharaoh put the throw down and he says, who is the Lord? Capital L-O-R-D. Because God said to Moses, he said something that he hadn't said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, here's my personal name. This is how you may know me. And so Moses comes back and says, the Lord, Yahweh, says to let the people go. And Pharaoh's like, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Pharaoh learns who the Lord is. <laughs> He's the one true God. But Pharaoh is really stubborn. So these plagues, one plague, miraculous plague after another, fall upon the Egyptians. And Pharaoh, each time, hardens his heart and says, nope. Uh, and, but he plays this game where sometimes he's like, oh, okay. And then he changes his mind. And so then we come to this last plague, and this last plague is pretty intense. It's the, by the word of the Lord, God says, I, on, on a set night, and it was determined, and that's what Exodus 12 is about, I'm going to slay the firstborn of every Egyptian in all the land of Egypt. Um, except, God says to Moses, he says, you're to go tell the Israelites that they are to take either a young goat, or preferably a lamb, uh, a one-year-old, and take it to sacrifice it you're going to eat that animal, but you're going to take the blood of that animal and you're going to spread it on the doorposts and the lintel, the lintel's the top piece across the door, uh, you're going to spread that blood across, the, across your door frame. Uh, and on the set night that the Lord has determined for the final judgment against Egypt and against Pharaoh, a, a judgment it says in the text was against the idols of Egypt. Egypt was full of idols. So each of the ten plagues actually corresponded to, to some of the, the, their false gods to prove that God was the one true God and that their religion was false. Uh, and, and so this last plague is coming, and that's what, he, that's what chapter 12 is about that we're going to look at today. Moses is preparing. It's a little bit confusing because Moses is preparing the people, but he's also giving future instructions at the same time. So the, when you read the passage, you've got to read it a few times and say, here's what you're to do presently, but at the very same time, he says, here's what you're to do in the future. Because you're to, you're to forever commemorate this great act of salvation of the Lord. You're not to forget how God rescued you and delivered you and saved you from this judgment. 
Uh, and so, so Moses is doing that. And then the second part of the text is God keeps his word. The firstborn of every Egyptian, it says in verse 12, on that night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, which is really interesting. And I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. Uh, and so Moses is preparing for it, and then it happens. Now one question they might have just before we read some of chapter 12 is why, the first, why was the firstborn centered out? And it, and it has to do with the fact that the firstborn son had absolute power in a family. And so they were in charge of the family. Um, they had power to control, they had power to dominate, and so by this act of judgment, um, one, they're left, in, a, in certain respects, leaderless, because the, the firstborn is, 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 is killed. Um, but it's also, Egypt is being paid back. She's being paid back for her sin, for her cruelty, for that, you know, when it talked about that whole policy of kill the firstborn son of, and so it's, it's a, God is, remember the Bible said, it is mine to avenge, the Lord will repay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is God's judgment on them for the 400 years of slavery and oppression that they had done against his people. Uh, but, it, but it begins with the, the linchpin is, is, is God is it's poured out on the one who thought they were in charge of everything and who thought they were the masters and, and it's against the firstborn. So that explains the firstborn son part of it. But it's, a, you know, it's an uncomfortable passage because it, 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 it portrays God in a light that sometimes people aren't comfortable with. You know, we, sometimes when we think about God, we're like, well, I, I'd like God to be like a big, cuddly grandfather. Um, instead of just, or instead of, you know, I want it to be just, but I want it to be soft and tender at the same time. And I, so, so sometimes passages like this where God's judgment's being poured out make some folks uncomfortable. And yet, we have a God who's perfectly just, who's perfectly holy, and who also gave and gives opportunities for people to be reconciled to him. That's the amazing thing about the cross. That's the amazing thing about Christ. Jesus is the ultimate, ultimate fulfillment of the passage, and we're going to look at that as we go through the text. But, but, uh, but, but first, let's have a look at it. And I, there's a, uh, let's read, we won't read the whole thing. Uh, raise your hand when you're tired. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, that's the wrong day to ask, because we all just lost that. <laughs> Well, just lost an hour of sleep. Um, so let's start. We're going to read some verses, starting at chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household's too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what can, you can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintels of the houses in which they eat it, they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Hence the celebration of Passover. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And that says in verse 14, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. And we'll stop there. Um, and so we see the establishment uh, of 
what you would recognize, Jewish holiday, Passover, continued, which carries on today. Uh, we, uh, the fulfillment is ultimately in Christ, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So we see that Moses is preparing them. He's saying to the people, this is how you prepare for this last judgment of God. Uh, and this is what you're to do if you wish to escape the judgment. Now that language, you and I understand when we think about, well, there's a judgment day coming for sin. How can I prepare for the coming judgment day? And what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us to go to Christ, the Lamb of God, who shed his blood for our forgiveness. Jesus, who took the punishment that we deserve. So that what happens on the day of judgment, we, like the Jews of old, were passed over. There's no fear, there's no con... I'm already telling you what's ahead. But there's no condemnation. <laughs> there's no condemnation, it says in Romans 8.1. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How can that be? How is it that I'm not afraid of the day of judgment? Because the Bible says that Jesus took my sin. And as the Jews were passed over by the blood of the Lamb marking their doors, because of the shed blood of Jesus and my being a follower of Jesus, I have no fear of the judgment to come. That's the amazing grace of God. And that's the ultimate fulfillment of the entire Passover uh, event, is, is, is it's, it's, it's tight for what Jesus did and what he did on the cross. But there's a few, uh, just as we look at the text itself, there's a few, uh, I decided to call it rabbit holes. And for those of you who are Alice in Wonderland, you'll know uh, down the rabbit hole. And uh, I found actually, I don't have it there, but there's a little picture of a rabbit staring down a hole. A rabbit hole is called a warren, W-A-R-R-E-N. So, and Warrens, uh, while a rabbit is cute, and some of you might have had one, um, uh, they're lovely except when they leave little things around, but uh, <laughs> they actually can be, they, they can be a pest. Um, there's some places I saw some pictures of rabbit Warrens, and they literally burrow and burrow and burrow underground and can break your horse's leg, your cow's leg, your, your leg if you step into it. Um, and so when you go down a rabbit hole, you don't know where you're going. Um, there's a, to get the rabbit, there, there's a lot of lefts and rights and ups and downs and, and dead ends. And so when I thought about uh, the passage, there's, some, there's a lot of neat things in here that we could, we could spend a whole lesson on. And so I call them rabbit holes. They're important, uh, but there's a few rabbit holes that we're, we're not going to spend a lot of time on. But if you want to dig a little bit more... Be my guest. Um, first is figuring out the Jewish calendar. That's kind of neat. Actually, in, in, in verse 1, it says, uh, verse 2, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year. This event, the event of God delivering the Israelites out of Egypt, God says, this is your new year. From henceforth, this month, God saying to the Jews, this is the beginning of the year. It doesn't matter where the beginning of the year has ever been before. This is now the beginning of your year. And so if you look at a Jewish calendar, the first month is called Nisan, and N-I-S-A-N, and it floats. Uh, for example, this year, Jewish New Year, is, begins April 6th. You know, I, I'm always wondering, like, why is Easter moving around all the time? <laughs> <laughs> it's because of the Jewish calendar. Uh, they, the Jew, Jewish calendar is based on a lunar cycle. And the lunar cycle is, is that it's more complex. It's not just as simple as 29 days in a month because sometimes there's 30 days in a month by the, when you work on the solar calendar. And so there's always this course correcting when it comes to lunar calendars, uh, which if you want to read the math, there's some mathematical formulas on how they kept the math for figuring out what month you were so that all of a sudden a new year didn't end up in October. So it's, it's actually quite complex, but it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> but, it's, but it's introduced to us in the text, is figuring out the Jewish calendar. It also, it helps you and I, because we're like, why does Easter keep moving? Easter keeps moving because of the lunar calendar that, that, that Passover is based on. Um, second thing that's uh, there is in, in verse 40 and 41, there's kind of a neat, uh, it's, it's neat, but it's, it's not as simple as people make things sometimes. It says, the time of the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the, that sounds pretty straightforward, doesn't it? It's a very specific number. And then it says, at the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. That sounds to me very specific. 
Except when you start reading commentaries, all of a sudden people are like, they don't like 430 years. They, they, and the reason they don't like it is they look at Genesis 46 and they're trying to figure out the timeline there and when was so-and-so born and how does, the, how does that math work out? And then all sorts of novel ideas are brought in. For example, they, you'll hear, sometimes you'll hear people say they were only there 215 years, the 430 started when Abraham went into the land of Canaan. And it's, there's, there's a huge amount of people writing on the subject. Um, but when I look at it, I'm just like, you know what? It says 430 years. I'm going to go with the 430. <laughs> like, like, it's, like it's, if it says it, I don't, it doesn't matter how many people argue against it. It says it. I'm going to go with it. It seems to be a very specific number. But people make simple things complex. Um, three, another rabbit hole, is figuring out, you know, sometimes you bump into some folks that are very adamant that they, that, you know, and we've done both at the church. We've had bread at the front that you've partaken of. We've had crackers. We've had gluten-free. Um, we've, you know, we've, we've had, uh, you know, we've, we've had a variety at the front. But there's some folks that are very adamant that if it's not unleavened bread, then it's not right. Um, and where does all of that come from? It comes out of the text because it talks about the Israelites taking unleavened bread and they're forbidden at Passover to use bread with leaven, with yeast. And so it's like a flat bread, it's, more, it's a solid piece of bread um, versus a fluffy piece. But when it comes to the matter, my, my sort of a take on it is, is today I don't think it matters because it doesn't say specifically so in the New Testament. What Jesus commands is that we do so in remembrance of him. Uh, but for some folks, the passage that causes the question is this particular passage. And then the fourth rabbit hole is, uh, is people, again, people who wish to explain away the ten, the 10 plagues. There's lots of websites of people, some of them saying they're Christians, um, uh, most of them not say, well, all the ten plagues, there's a naturalistic explanation for all of them. And the naturalistic explanation for the last plague, when, I don't know what percentage of the family was, was killed, percentage-wise, um, if, even if you go with the average Egyptian family with six people, one out of six is pretty high. Uh, but people say, that's not a big deal. The black plague killed 50% of Europe in four years. And so, naturalistic people trying to explain away God's miracles, they're like, well, the Black Plague over a four-year period killed 50% of everybody. And so there's a natural, they say, well, with all the stuff that preceded this, there's gotta be some other way to explain it than saying it was a miracle. But the, past, the point of the passage is, is there is one true God and his name is the Lord. Mm -hmm. These are miracles mm -hmm. proving that God is, is God. Mm -hmm. And so, so but that's, a, that's a rabbit hole that some people go down. So there's a few uh, aspects of the text that are tricky, uh, but what is it, uh, but ultimately, and I already mentioned this, I thought this was a cool picture. Um, they took red and they made it for the world, because who did Jesus die for? Jesus, so the Passover, as I already mentioned, and it bears repeating, the Passover finds its fulfillment in Christ. You know, the, the Bible says on the night he was betrayed, he took red. Mm -hmm. He said, this is a new covenant, right? And he took the blood, and took the juice, and he said, "This is it's a." He said, "The Passover is about me." Yeah. That's what Jesus said. And he says, "You're to remember what I did forever." God said to the Israelites, "You're to remember how I saved you forever." Jesus says, "You know what? It, that's that whole thing about the blood. It all points to me and my work on the cross. The greatest, God, the great act of salvation, delivering people out of Egypt." The greater act of salvation is saving us from our sins and from the judgment to come. That's what's accomplished by the death of Jesus on the cross. That, you know, when John the, ba John, John the Baptist said, look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and we're reminded in the Gospels, why did Jesus come? He came on a rescue mission. Why, what's the rescue about? Saving us from our sin, saving us from the judgment. And hence that very important verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are Christ Jesus. We don't walk by fear. We walk by faith, trusting in God. 
who was made for our, our salvation. And that's available to anyone who would humble themselves and come to the Lord for the forgiveness of their sins, putting their trust in Christ. So that's the ultimate ending of it is it takes us to Jesus. The Passover celebration of the Jews takes us to the night when Jesus was betrayed, when he's celebrating the Passover, and he says, it's really all about me and what I'm about to do on the cross. Uh, that's, where the, that's where we join, we connect the dots in the scripture. Um, but then, I, just as we close, there's two things I want to leave you with. Um, uh, two things that kind of, two, the two verses, there's two verses that drew me to the text in the first, first point. Uh, and, you know, when you, when you read, and I'm hoping that you'll, you'll keep on reading Exodus on your own, you're going to find different verses that the Lord will sort of grab a hold of your imagination with along the way. That's the exciting thing about personal Bible study, is you'll be reading it, I'll be reading it, we'll, we'll be reading it collectively, but God, God will speak to each of us along the way from, di from different verses. It's still all God's Word, but that's the way the Lord works. And so I, when I was reading it, chapter 12, um, verse 11 caught my attention. Um, it says in, in verse 12, Moses is giving them instructions on how to cook the meat, how to prepare the meat, how to get ready for this, this final plague. And he says, when you're getting ready, and when you're actually eating of it, you should, this is how you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you should eat it, you eat it quick, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, don't, you're not there for a party, you're, something's happening tonight. You're slaying the animal at twilight, and at midnight, something is extraordinary is going to happen. Um, and that's when the, the, the angel of the Lord executed judgment. Um, and, and there's this sense of haste, but the reason that this, and it's a little verse, it's easy to, it's easy to uh, run over that um, and miss that whole verse and think, well, it's not that important. Sure, they're eat fast, be ready. But then I thought, actually, there's a point of that, isn't there? Um, what did Jesus, you know, the parable of the, the, the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish? Uh, one of the things Jesus says is, therefore, keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. He's talking about his return. Keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. Here Moses is exhorting them to a state of, of readiness. Uh, and so when you and I when, I, when I think about our celebration of the Lord's table, you know, we, it says, we eat and drink this until he comes. Uh, and so there's to be this sense of preparation on our part, a sense of readiness. This world is not my home. I, I, yeah, I have an apartment, I have a house, I have some things I'm trying to do, but ultimately that all pales to the bigger point that this is not my home and I'm not really living for here. I've actually been given a mission from God of sharing Christ and living for him. I need to be ready for, for, for it. And so this, eat it in haste and have your belt tucked, your, what is it, have your belt fastened. That's always a good thing too, anyway. So, <laughs> but uh, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Being prepared for the, for the coming of the Lord. And so I thought, I can see there's application to that, to me and to us as Christians. Being ready for, the, for Christ's coming and living like like it, like with the kingdom of God in mind. The other uh, verse that caught my attention was down in the down at the very end, um, and, it, and it's chapter twelve, verse forty-two. It says it's really amazing. You know, in the ESV it says watching, in some other versions it says God kept a vigil. It, it was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout the generations. So you're supposed to stay up that night if you're Jewish. Um, it, because of what God did, God watched over, God kept vigil. Now vigil, I, I found it, I guess a part of it grabbed me because of, it's a, I find it a touching image, really. Um, the idea of uh, God keeping vigil, God watching over me, God watching over his people, God being there to care, God being there to comfort, God hearing, God having a rescue plan. It all reminds me of God's call. Remember when God, God said to, to Moses, I've seen, I see my people, I've hear, heard their cries, I, I, I care about them, I'm going to rescue them, I'm calling you, I'm equipping you, 
I'm sending you, I'm going to walk with you. And then we have this picture of God says, I've, been keep, I've kept vigil over you. I'm, I'm the God who watches over you. Uh, and, and it specifically says, God says, I'm watching over you right now, is what he's saying to, to the people. And that's what, that got my attention. Um, and then I thought, well, is there other passages that give us this picture? And for those of you, the idea of vigil, we often, we connect with that, right? Someone in your family is sick, what do you do? Most, most people, if possible, they, we drop everything and go to their side. Um, you, you, you have a family member that's in the hospital, you go to the hospital, you're by their bedside. Um, you have a close friend, you, you say, well, how can, I, how can I look after you? And so the idea of watching over and keeping vigil, we, we get it. But for me, such a powerful image of the, the Heavenly Father who's doing that for us, watching over us, caring for us. And, and, it's, that's, and it's a, I don't know, it took, the, I, I just find it, it, just, it somehow gets past some of my defenses, <laughs> and, and, and it's comforting in my heart to know that that's how God looks at me, and that's how he looks at us in Christ. We are special to him, and he's watching over us, keeping vigil over us, even if we can't feel it. Um, he, it says he's still there. Uh, there's a neat verse, and i uh, we've got two more. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. He is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. God is the one who watches over us. He keeps vigil over us. And that flows out of a little verse, Exodus 12, 42, and all of a sudden you got Psalm, Psalm 121. And then there's a neat thing. Sometimes we, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a, I only mention it because it completes the picture. Um, the disciples, they didn't always do great. We don't always do great. Um, Jesus actually asked his disciples to keep watch with him, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, it says that Jesus went to the place called Gethsemane. He said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and two sons of Zebedee with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Um, and then... Um, and then Jesus, they fell asleep. <laughs> right? Um, they fell asleep. Jesus said to them, couldn't you keep watching me for one hour? And yet, what is Jesus? He's gracious. He's forgiving. Um, and, then he, and we know he's gracious and forgiving because he says, I know your flesh is weak, but your spirit is willing. Um, and so when I think about what a beautiful picture, our, our Savior said to these three, keep watch of me. And they did. And sometimes you and I, we don't always live up to what we're supposed to do. Uh, and yet we have a Savior who's gracious with us, who's forgiving, who's tender, who's gentle, uh, and, who, and who, is, who loves us. Uh, and, and, and the Bible says of Christ and his, and his watching over us, he will never leave you and he'll never forsake you. And so those are the two verses. The, re the, the idea of readiness that drew me in, and how we're, this is in our home, we're to be ready for Christ's return. And also the idea of we have a heavenly father who keeps vigil for us, and who's watching over us, and who cares for us. Let's stand together as we sing.